Sometimes, when I'm at the scrapyard, I actually remember to take out my phone and video my adventures sticking through piles of discarded electronics. I never know what I will find. And that is part of the excitement of going there. Hardware, once high-end and very pricey, is now left in the desert for scrap and precious metal recovery. But sometimes, I get extremely lucky and find the gems you want to see on my channel. And they are... Pentium 3s with 1000 MHz. Even though they are the 133 MHz frontside bus models, they are still 1 GHz slot 1 copper mine CPUs. After some cleaning and testing, I can confirm that both Pentium 3s work flawlessly in one of my ASUS P2Bs I recently restored. They are also worthy to carry one of the new stickers I got for my channel. Any hardware I can restore will get at least one of those stickers. But those CPUs are not the main focus of today's video. While digging through the pile of scrapped electronics, I also found this. A slot 1 CPU without the plastic case. And I wondered if it still works. But first, let's gather some extra information about the CPU. Let's start with assessing its physical condition. You can tell from the looks of this CPU, it had a tough time at the scrapyard. The silicon die is scratched, with small pieces chipped off from the corners and edges. It doesn't look severe however. The core may still be functioning. We also can see a lot of missing SMD components, mainly capacitors and resistors. When we turn the cartridge around, damage traces catch the eye. I am sure some of them are severed, but we will confirm that very soon under the microscope. Finally, this larger chip seems to have suffered from a hard impact. Another spot we should have a closer look at under the microscope. Now let's figure out whether it is a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3. Unfortunately, model numbers, serial numbers or tags, which would help us identify the CPU, are nowhere to be found. So, let's go back to basics, comparing it to a few models of my collection. The topmost is a Pentium 2 450D shoots with 512KB of level 2 cache. The second is a Pentium 3 450 Katmai, featuring 512KB of level 2 cache, like the Pentium 2. Third is a Pentium 3 650 copper mine, this time with 256KB of integrated level 2 cache. But now, the cache is clocked at the full CPU frequency. The former two Pentiums had the level 2 cache clocked at half the CPU speed only. And finally, a Pentium 3 capable to operate at 1000 MHz. Also a copper mine having 256 kilobytes of level 2 cache. This is one of the two CPUs I showed you at the very beginning of this video. The unknown CPU looks similar to the models 3 and 4. So, our unknown CPU is most likely a copper mine Pentium 3. But to know for sure, we need to get this CPU to boot and tell us what it is. But before we fix the traces and reinstall the missing SMD components, a quick word from today's video sponsor. PCBWay. If you like to tinker with electronic projects like I do, you will reach a point when your projects would benefit from printed circuit boards. PCBWay is the ideal partner to turn your ideas into reality. With PCBWay's assembly services, you may not even need to touch a soldering iron. And if you feel that single color PCBs are too boring for your projects, you can order full color PCBs with your custom designs to stand out from the crowd. Visit PCBWay.com to learn more about their other services like 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and CNC machining. Links are in the video description. Now let's continue with the broken traces of the Pentium 3. I follow the same procedure as usual when fixing traces. Use an engraving pen to remove parts of the solder mask, apply fresh solder over the exposed traces and prepare 0.1mm copper wires to bridge the gaps. Flux is essential to make solder flow nicely over the traces and around the copper wires. If you try to solder without flux, you will most likely create solder bridges with neighboring traces and bad looking solder connections. Flux helps the solder to flow nicely to the places we want it to go. It makes working on those microscopic traces a lot easier. And soon after, the 3 to 4 traces on this cartridge have been reconnected. Now, let's examine the twisted chip before we work on the missing SMD components. It doesn't look too bad. We probably could leave this chip as is, since I don't see the corner pin touching the neighboring pin. Nevertheless, I decided to widen the gap with a knife. We all heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
That is true in many cases and applies here too. Luckily, I did not make it worse by breaking off the pin in the corner. The last thing we need to take care of is to reinstall the missing SMD components. It is usually easier to find the correct values of resistors. For one, most of them have their values printed on the package. And second, you may get their values by measuring the resistance with a multimeter. However, this only applies if they are not connected in parallel with other resistors or components. Ceramic capacitors on the other hand do not have their values printed on the case. We need to measure the same components on a comparable CPU to know their values. The comparable CPU I will use is the 650 MHz copper mine we have seen before. In most cases, measuring capacitors in circuit will not result in correct or usable values. This is typically due to multiple capacitors being connected in parallel or other components influencing their capacitance. From my experience, it is uncommon to measure the correct value when a capacitor is in circuit. Therefore, I desoldered the capacitors from the working Pentium 3, matching the missing SMD components on our unknown CPU. Once disconnected from the circuit, we can measure the capacitance with a multimeter. Remember what I said about resistors having the values printed on the housing? Well, not all of them come with a value conveniently printed on the top. Some resistors on this cartridge are missing this information. In such cases, I have to measure the values using a multimeter. To be sure I got the correct value, I used the same technique as with the capacitors by desoldering the corresponding resistor from the working Pentium 3 for a conclusive measurement. I did get stuck on resistor R19 for a while. This resistor cracked in the middle and we have to replace it, but we do not know its resistance. And since it is damaged, we cannot use a multimeter to measure its value either. R16 and R17 on the other hand have their values printed on the housing. Both are 3.3 kilo ohm resistors. Similar to R19, R18 is a blacktop resistor without any indication of what value it has. Since those two traces look almost identical, I assume that R19 should probably have a value similar to R18. A multimeter tells me that R18 is a 3.7 kilo ohm resistor. The Pentium 3 650 has an identical resistor configuration for R16 and R18. 3.3 kilo ohms for R16 and 3.7 kilo ohms for R18. R17 and R19 are different. Both spots are populated with 0 ohm resistors. That makes it less likely that our unknown CPU is a 650 MHz copper mine. On the 1 GHz Pentium 3, however, the resistors match. R17 is a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor and R19 measures 3.7 kilo ohms. Could this be another 1000 MHz copper mine? I tried to find out what value resistor R19 was before it broke. And I'm unsure if this is a legitimate way of measuring broken resistors. But surprisingly, I did get a value in the 3 kilo ohm range. Unfortunately, I only had a 3.3 kilo ohm resistor instead of the 3.7 kilo ohm resistor that was here before. Hopefully, this will be good enough for this circuit to work. I could borrow the resistor from the Gigahertz CPU, but for now, I'd rather not do that. All that's left is to install a few more missing capacitors, and then we are ready to test this unknown copper mine CPU.
Oh no, the post analyzer card stops at C0. Well, at least there is a sign of life coming from this unknown CPU, but it stops what seems to be the first thing it does. Based on information I found online, C0 means turn off chipset cache. I don't know why it gets stuck there or what could be the cause, but if you have any clues, let me know in the comments. The board definitely works with other CPUs. So could we have missed something? Another broken trace somewhere? Or did I miss a cracked SMD component? Before you guys write it in the comments, I want to mention that I also replaced resistors R19 and R18 with 3.9 kilo ohm resistors to closer match the original values. But there was no change. I also tested this processor on an ASUS P3BF. But again, the post process stopped at code C0. Unfortunately, this is as far as I got with it. If you have any suggestions on what I could try, feel free to drop them in the comments. But I do not want to stop this project here. There is one more secret to be lifted. Pentium 3 CPUs have different voltage requirements, from 1.6 to 1.8 volts. We can measure the voltage this CPU requests on one of the MOSFETs, next to the slot 1 connector. Even though the boot process stops at code C0, we can measure a voltage of 1.7 on the MOSFET. Unfortunately, that doesn't help us much, because most Pentium 3 CPUs have a voltage specification of 1.65 to 1.75 volts. So it doesn't help us narrow down what model this is, but 1.7 volts is again identical to the 1 GHz copper mine we have seen at the beginning of this video. Another characteristic that makes it more likely this to be a 1 GHz Pentium 3. But it's all still speculation until we get this processor to boot. Instead, let's figure out how the processor communicates its required operating voltage to the motherboard. If you thought it must be some intricate circuitry within the silicon die, you'd be mistaken. The single edge contact cartridge, or SECC for short, has 121 pins on each side. Side A has the shorter section after the notch to the right, while side B has the shorter section to the left. Some of the pin designations are silk screened on the PCB. We are interested in pins A119 to A121, B119 and B120. Those five pins configure the voltage regulator module on the motherboard to deliver the correct voltage to the CPU. From the pins on the edge connector, we see traces leading to a section with space for four resistors on both sides of the cartridge. By placing 0 ohm resistors across these pads in various combinations, we can configure the power control chip on the motherboard. I replaced the power control chip on 6 ASUS P2B motherboards to unlock lower voltage configurations. This modification makes those boards compatible with Coppermine CPUs, which weren't available when the boards entered the market. If you're interested in more details and have not watched the series of me fixing those boards yet, then I highly recommend that you watch the video about board number 3, where I cover the power control chip modification. In the datasheet of the chip, you will see a table containing supported voltages, including the code required for each configuration. Unfortunately, you can easily get lost looking at the various labels. However, we have seen VID0 to VID4 on the pinout of the Pentium cartridge. Those names are also present in the datasheet of the power control chip. Coincidence? No. The resistors, the pins on the Pentium cartridge and the power control chip are part of one system. The number 0 represents a connection to ground. That is when a 0 ohm resistor connects one of the pins on the cartridge to ground. To find your way around, you can use a multimeter and check what pin connects to which set of resistor pads. We need to find out which resistor is controlling what VID. Let's start with pin A121. It is the only pin that does not have a resistor associated with it. This pin controls signal VID4 and connects to ground through a trace. Therefore, VID4 will always be 0. Consequently, we cannot configure a voltage above 2.05, unless we cut the trace or isolate pin A121 on the edge connector. VID0 through VID3, however, are connected to resistor pads and are configurable. To make things a bit easier, I created an Excel sheet that can determine the voltage by entering which resistors are present. Coppermine PCBs have four resistor spots. On our unknown CPU, only one resistor is present. So then let's input the code of our CPU into the sheet. As mentioned before, VID4 permanently connects to ground through a trace. Therefore, we must select short for VID4 on pin A121. 
The only other resistor on this cartridge is R15. It controls VID3 and is connected to pin B119. When I set the correct field to short, the Excel sheet outputs a value of 1.7 volts, exactly what we measured with a multimeter on the MOSFET before. Ok, great. But what else can we do with this information? Do you remember that an unmodified ASUS P2B cannot deliver voltages below 1.8 volts? Almost all copper mine CPUs require a voltage of 1.75 or lower. An unmodified P2B will not boot with a CPU asking for an out of spec voltage. We worked around this limitation by using a Pentium 3 for socket 370 on an adapter capable of overwriting the voltage configuration of the CPU. Those dip switches do the same thing the resistors do on our Pentium cartridge. Unfortunately, there are no dip switches on Pentium 3 CPUs like this one. To achieve the same trick of slightly overvolting the CPU, making it work in older slot 1 motherboards, we need to change the combination of resistors in a way so they tell the motherboard to deliver 1.8 volts, the minimum voltage supported by the original power control chip. We can use the Excel sheet again to determine which resistors have to be installed to get 1.8 volts on the CPU. Select 1.8 volts from this drop down box and we get the resistors we need to install on the cartridge. And it looks like we need one additional 0 ohm resistor on R14. Then let's do this and test if the board indeed delivers 1.8 volts after this mod. And we measure 1.8 volts on the MOSFET. Unfortunately, this modification didn't magically convince this CPU to work. The boot process still stops at postcode C0. So, we could not lift the mystery of what exact model this Pentium 3 is. But if you have any idea what we could try next, please let me know. There are signs of life coming from the CPU, and I suspect this to be another 1000 MHz Coppermine Pentium 3. But we won't know for sure until we get it to post. I'm really curious to read your ideas in the comments. And if you want to get a copy of the Excel sheet, please visit my website from where you can download it. I may update the sheet once I get more CPUs and their layouts. Unfortunately, the resistor names change from generation to generation and even from model to model. So there is no guarantee to find the exact designation of the resistor pads in the Excel sheet. And some models, like Deschutes and Katmai, have only one place to add a resistor, but different names on the silk screen. And this is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed looking deeper into Intel's single edge contact cartridge and how it communicates with the motherboard what voltage to supply to the processor. Also, let me know your guesses what model this is. I hope we will be able to get it to post with the help of your ideas and suggestions. And finally, I want to thank all my Patreons for their invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.